Great. So welcome, Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia Beck is a master's student in the clinical psychology program at the University of Regina. She works as a research assistant in the online therapy unit and provides voluntary suicide intervention response services to Southeast Saskatchewan. Cynthia and her husband, Wade, along with their two children, farm in partnership with Wade's family. The Becks operate a mixed farming operation near uh, it's at Millstone, Saskatchewan, um, consisting of purebred charlet, a commercial cow herd, and, a, and grain farming. Welcome, Cynthia, and if uh, you have the ability to share your screen and unmute yourself, uh, now would be the time. Thank you very much, David. Uh, before I get started, I have a little bit of a challenge for everybody um, because I think that for a lot of people, mental health is kind of like this, I don't know if I, if I want to call it taboo or scary, um, but a lot of people kind of dismiss uh, mental health and think, well, I'm fine. You know, I've been doing this for years and I'm just going to keep going the way I'm going. So I, I want to approach mental health in a bit of a different way um, based on who we are as cattle producers. Okay, so here's my question for you that I'd like you to think about just for a brief moment. Um, and if you wanna type a chat and respond, or if you wanna turn your camera on and respond, you're more than welcome. Uh, I'm the type of person doing a presentation that if you have a question, feel free to stop me and ask, like right while I'm, um, like right while I'm talking instead of waiting until the end, because a lot of time, I, if you have a question, you are so focused on maintaining the question that you lose all of the information that's shared after the question arises. And then, you know, when it comes to the end of it, you're like, ah, crap, I can't think of what the question was. So here's my challenge or my question for you. Uh, if you could think for a moment about the most important piece of equipment that you have on your farm. So uh, it would be the piece of equipment that, you know, you require every day in order to sustain your farm, feed your cattle, um, and ultimately kind of leads you to success, right? Because you're still here, you're still doing this. Uh, so does anybody have any ideas? So Anne typed in me, just one second, I'm looking at responses. I, I've got a person saying a tractor, silage wagon, tractor, silage wagon, the dog. That's awesome. That's the first time I've heard that response that I've asked this question for a while. A hy the hydro. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually going to go back. All of those things are really important. They're really important pieces of equipment on the farm. But here's the thing. None of that machinery, not even your dog, will work if, if you're not there operating it. If you are not there um, providing the guidance, providing the fuel, um, making the whistles or the commands, uh, none of it will run without you. So I'm just going to kind of preface this presentation with that tidbit of information. You are the most important piece of machinery on your farm. Uh, you also are the number one driver behind the success of your operations, you and the people that you farm with or you ranch with. So I'd just like to leave you with that little message before we get started. One second, I'm figuring out how to share. I told Carson I would do this and now I'm like, screen share. Um, Host, can you uh, enable me to share my screen, please? So I should have made you a co-host now, Cynthia. Oh, I'm Hope. sorry, Carson. Okay, well, you go ahead and share my screen. Actually, I just, it should be, you should be a co-host now, so you should be able to share your screen from the bottom. If not, I will load up your slides. Oh, I got it. Thank you. Sorry, you guys. Okay, so what is mental health and well-being? Well, I kind of just basically described it in a nutshell, having the ability to run your operation. And I'm going to make it that simple. Um, and some people might say to me, well, there's a lot more to it. Well, yeah, I could 
science nerd you to death because I'm also one of those, uh, but I'm not going to today. So in this context, um, what I'm talking about with mental health is if you are a person who has your mental, who has good mental health, I'll say, you have the ability to meet your daily functioning needs. So what that means is you have the ability to get up in the morning, go feed your cattle, uh, do herd health checks, um, maintain your machinery, uh, all of that stuff. And, and it's not a matter of getting through the day, because I know that a lot of us do that, but it's more a matter of, yeah, I can do this. I'm, I'm, I'm getting through, I'm being successful. You know, each day you, you manage to make it through and hopefully you have a sense of satisfaction at the end of the day. Um, balanced thinking is another part of mental health. And a lot of times we don't recognize the importance that thinking plays in our day-to-day -day operations. So sometimes um, we make decisions that we kind of look back on and go like, oh crap, like why, why did I do that? I wasn't thinking. Well, sometimes we actually lose the ability or capability to think because we are experiencing um, challenges with our mental or physical health. Uh, and that's the good decision-making part. Farm safe behavior, um, I don't know how many people, I think that we all do this, we get swept away in all of the expectations or the obligations or the to-do lists where we just have so much to get done that it's kind of like, let's just charge through this and get through our day. Um, and sometimes when we do that, the, the decision-making abilities that we have kind of switches over into risk-taking, where we might take risks that we wouldn't normally take. Uh, and also, mental health includes balanced emotions. So I don't know how many of you sort cattle with a partner, um, but sometimes, you know, we, we're not able to kind of hold on to our emotions and um, not lash out and be aggressive towards the people who are helping us, us or be aggressive towards livestock sometimes as well. Uh, and healthy coping. So I don't know about you guys, um, but stress is kind of a common. Uh, stress is a factor that I think everyone deals with. And there are there is such a thing as good stress. Um, there's also such a thing as really unhealthy stress. And when we have good mental health, it actually kind of lifts us up to give us the ability to deal with stress that we may not otherwise be able to deal with. Uh, so mental health kind of has lots of aspects to it. Um, number one, within your body though, uh, it's a combination of our thoughts, our emotions, our bodily sensations, and our behaviors. Now, when I was working, I worked in the psychiatric unit at Regina General Hospital um, for last semester, last fall. And I was on the adolescent unit. And I think this was the most important thing that we taught uh, the adolescents was learning the importance of recognizing our thoughts and what our thoughts can do for driving our emotions, driving what our body actually is doing and driving our behaviors. So I'm going to give you one example. Um, say we're really dry. And, and I mean, up until we had the snow, we were really dry also, and, and we may be dry again. But say that we're in a position that we are super dry and we start thinking about that all of the time. And and we're thinking to ourselves, like, we're never going to get through this year. I, I'm, a, I'm going to be a total failure. I don't have enough money in the bank. I have nothing to fall back on. I, I can't. I can't do this. I can't do this. So as you are talking about all of that, your nervous system will actually respond because your nervous system senses danger. Now, I mean, you're, you're probably not physically in danger, and hopefully you're not. But your nervous system does not know that. So here's what happens. Your nervous system kind of just goes and, and reacts in order to fight whatever the danger is or give you the ability to run away from danger. 
So what happens is for people who experience regular anxiety or panic attacks, uh, it's kind of a combination of your thoughts uh, and how those thoughts are controlling or triggering your emotions and your body sensations. So a lot of times when we kind of get that anxious feeling or we feel a bit panicky, um, that emotion can start to come out in different ways. So for some people, it might come out as anger. Um, for other people, they might shut down because it's just way too much to deal with. And then what happens is we do other things to react. So we use behaviors to cope or compensate for the, uh, the thoughts that we're thinking, the emotions that we're feeling, or the sensations that we have going on in our body. So here might be an example. Um, right now it's dry out. Uh, I don't know how many people are calving right now. We kind of are coming to the end of calving. Um, but say that we haven't calved all of our cows yet, but I'm thinking to myself like, crap, it is so dry. There is no way that we're gonna be able to do this. And I kind of work myself up into a panic. Well, when I get that way, in order to cope, I might think to myself, like, I, I can't do this. I got to go do something to get my mind off of this. Um, well, that might be when I go and I drink a bottle of wine in order to cope. Uh, some people go to bed in order to cope. Some people use drugs. Uh, some people go shopping. Uh, but what tends to happen with us in the farming community is we go work harder, <laughs> which is admirable, but sometimes it's not helpful. Sometimes we are working ourselves into the ground. Or we make really rash decisions. So sometimes we can make really rash decisions that don't help us in the long run. Um, we might decide that, you know, we've got 50 cows left to calve, let's sell them, even though the market prices are potentially in the tank, right? Well, that's not going to help us long term because we've invested time and energy and money into those cows and we're not getting the money out of it after. So I, I hope that that makes sense. And if anybody has questions, please feel free to post it in the chat um, or I'll figure out how to see it on the side of my screen. <laughs> so how are we affected by mental health? Well, I kind of already covered that. Uh, number one in our thinking our decision-making and the risk-taking, how we handle stress, how we cope with emotion, how we communicate, uh, and our mental health drives our behavior and affects physical health. So I think I kind of mentioned this before, when we, kind of, when we get into a situation where we may not be feeling our best, um, whether that's physically or mentally, we may come to a point where we just, we just stop talking. Uh, we stop talking to our partner or our spouse. We start talking to um, potentially our employees. Or we communicate in a way that is really, really unhealthy. Um, and I'm talking about communication more than, you know, someone sitting in the tractor and mouthing the signs of like, go open the gate and there's 52 gates. I'm, I'm not talk talking about that type of communication. But more like... Um, the angry, the angry, the resentful, and the bitter communication. A lot of people don't know that our mental health actually affects our physical health. So for people who are dealing with anxiety, depression, um, they have really high levels of stress, and they're having difficulty coping, that increases our chance for cardiovascular disease, uh, heart attacks, strokes, that type of thing. So for anybody who thinks to themselves, mental health is not important, um, even if you have great mental health, it is still really important. What are the warning signs? Well, um, I wish that it was that easy, that it was somebody standing on the street corner holding up a sign, or if you were out feeding the cows and you looked over and your partner had a health sign. Uh, it's not that easy, and I wish it was. So here are the warning signs that you can notice in someone else um, or within yourself. So if your sleep changes, uh, if you go from being a person who normally gets whatever, seven hours of sleep or six hours of sleep, and you suddenly are not sleeping, you lay awake and you think, um, 
or you go from being able to function on, you know, the six hours of sleep, and then suddenly you're needing like 10 or 12 hours. That's an indication that you have something going on or that the person in your environment has something going on. Also, eating changes usually occur when people start to experience um, poor mental health. So maybe they were somebody who was healthy, uh, ate healthy or ate regular meals, and then suddenly they go without eating for the day and maybe they don't eat until they come in at 11 o'clock. Another aspect of mental health fluctuations is really, really low energy or really, really high energy. So sometimes people think that um, depression is only being downtrodden or sad or crying or angry. Um, but what can also happen when a person is kind of sliding uh, into depression or anxiety is that their body will try to compensate and it just like ramps up the energy really, really high, um, which for some people, like I got to tell you, I, I really enjoy the days where I have a lot of energy because I have a lot to accomplish in my day, but it's not sustainable in the long run and it can actually burn us out. Uh, also, if our emotions are off, so if you are having a normal day and there's not really any extra stress going on, if that's possible in the beef world, um, and you, you just feel off or your partner or your employee just feels off um, or they're having trouble concentrating, well, then maybe something's going on for them. Also a big one is if people have started isolating themselves or they've stopped communicating. So isolation means that um, maybe you are not going out and doing the activities that you used to do. Uh, part of that isolation is also not doing activities that you enjoy anymore. And um, this is maybe an uncomfortable topic for, he, to, for people to hear, but if you have a partner and suddenly one of you is no longer interested in sex and you used to be, um, that actually may be an indication that you've got something going on mental health wise. Also, if you engage in risky behavior and again, poor judgment or decision making. So say you have somebody in your world who is really like fiscally responsible and suddenly they go out and they buy like, I don't know, a new air seater or um, a new silage wagon or um, like a corn thrasher or anything like that. And, and there's no discussion and that's very uncharacteristic of them. Um, something may be going on. I, the just sucking today's bull crap out of my head. I love this picture, <laughs> it depicts so much. Um, this picture, I'm sorry, but I borrowed it off the internet. Uh, and it's a picture of a woman actually getting her hair done and that's a dryer in like the 1950s, 1960s. Um, I wish it was that easy to kind of remove all of the crap that occupies our brain time, um, but it's not, uh, but we can deal with it. And that's part of what messes up our well-being. Is the occupy what occupies our brain time? Uh, number one thing that messes with our well-being is a lack of sleep. Um, that's the first question. No, the second question. Uh, when someone goes into hospital into a psychiatric unit, uh, the first question that they're asked is, um, "Are you thinking about killing yourself?" Uh, and the second question is, "How much sleep have you had in the last week?" I the lack of sleep. Um, is the number one way to put yourself into a, into a psychotic episode. So when we don't sleep, our brain actually can't function. So I don't know how many of you have periods of time when you go without sleep. I don't know, calving, <laughs> um, silaging. There, there's lots of times uh, where we are just not able to get an adequate amount of sleep. That sleep deprivation adds up over time. So there is research out there that has been making a link between really extended periods of a lack of sleep and an increase in uh, Alzheimer's. So there is a connection there where the lack of sleep can affect your mental health and in the long term it can really affect your physical health. How you fuel yourself 
uh, goes a long way with mental health. So number one, uh, drink some water. Um, your tractor does not operate without fuel. Well, neither does your body, even though you think it may can. Um, fuel yourself with food. Please eat more than one meal a day. Uh, and how you treat yourself basically is kind of the thoughts that you say to yourself or the or the, the language that you use um, when you have those conversations in your head. And I think that maybe everybody does this. We, we kind of have a running dialogue um, going on for us. So if you use language like, that was so stupid, I'm stupid, um, I can't do this, I'm never going to get through this calving season, uh, I'm not a good farmer, or if you are constantly comparing yourself to others, that is really harmful too, because number one, what other people are doing, uh, there is no way to adequately compare because we don't know the details that everybody else has. Your neighbor down the road has a brand new manure spreader and a silage wagon. Well, it doesn't speak to their success or your failure. Um, it may speak to a higher debt ratio. Who knows, right? But comparing ourselves is really, really detrimental to our mental health. Crappy relationships, I don't, I probably don't have to tell you more about that. Um, when we are in relationships that are unhealthy, whether that is with a partner uh, or a spouse, um, whether that is with family that we don't farm with, family that we do farm with, or employees, um, those crappy relationships really take a toll on us over time. Also stress at home and the farm. I, I think that that goes without saying that, um, that, that that causes stress for us, right? Also brain chemicals and hormones. So I, I don't want to science nerd bore you to death, <laughs> even though I could talk about this stuff for hours and hours. Um, but I do wanna say one thing about our brain chemicals and our hormones, which is really important for people to hear. Just gonna change my page, if I can get it to work. So a lot of people don't realize that the chemicals, like the, the neurochemicals and the hormones that we have in our body, um, we, we need to create this, these things in order to function. And so what happens when we get really, really run down, uh, when we get really tired, if we're not fueling ourselves properly, um, or if we're dealing with something with physical health, that our body actually loses its ability to produce some of these chemicals that we, we really desperately need in order to operate. So for people who experience uh, anxiety, if you look on the screen and you'll see the blue, um, like the blue test tube there with anxiety, uh, for people who experience anxiety, their body is having a problem creating dopamine for them. Uh, or people who have depression, their body is having a really hard time creating serotonin. And so here's the thing. If our bodies are taking a break and they're just not able to keep up right now, then store-bought is fine. So I, I just need to kind of reiterate how important that, that is. Uh, if our bodies are just needing a bit of a break from creating everything that it needs to create to keep us functioning, then getting store-bought hormones and neurotransmitters and chemicals, those are fine. So if you are having a really tough time, go and talk to your doctor. Um, and perhaps being on an antidepressant or uh, an anxiety medication uh, might only be short-term for you because sometimes we just need it to get us through a season, like high production seasons, where we don't have time to properly care for ourselves. And I'm going to put it to you this way. How, how many of you, if you have a calf that's newborn, a newborn calf that is struggling, uh, you've got say a, a heifer, first time calver that is having a hard time producing milk or her milk hasn't come in adequately yet. How many of you would leave the calf to die or you would go get some colostrum and get some calf, some colostrum in that calf. Nobody would pass judgment on giving a calf colostrum to help it get a healthy start 
um, and to kind of get it going so that we're setting it up for success, right? We wouldn't pass judgment on that. So think of the, those store-bought antidepressants or may, uh, anxiety medication, whatever they are, think of them as milk replacer, <laughs> basically, uh, a very simplified version, but the store-bought is fine. So what helps us? What helps us to kind of get on top of our mental health? Well, I, you've heard me preaching it, it's sleep, right? Um, a lot of people think that you need to have, you know, a solid seven hours of sleep. I, if you are a cattle producer and you are in the midst of calving, sleep whenever you can. Uh, I don't care if it's for three hours at a time at night and then you lay down and you have uh, a half hour nap in the afternoon. Getting that sleep is really, really, really important. Fuel your body. Um, please eat. Please eat before you go to chores in the morning. Uh, make sure that you're drinking some water. And, and the reason that I say it in that manner is um, how many of you would leave the house in the morning, jump in your processor, jump in the tractor, whatever, and, and head down the road to the field um, without checking the fuel, uh, without checking the oil, and not even looking at the tires to see if you have a flat tire? I, I don't think any of us would do that, right? Yet a lot of us do that with our body on a regular basis. And, and it's one day, I mean, if you drive down the road with your tractor and there's no fuel in it, it is going to leave you stranded on the side of the road. And guess what? Your, your body may do that to you as well. So if you can fuel your body with some food, fuel it with some water, uh, and, and hopefully you can get some joy in life because that's actually fuel too for us. Uh, and that goes a long way. Also, notice what belongs to you. So here's the point of comparing to a neighbor. That that stuff, that, that does not belong to you. That's someone else's, okay? Um, and a lot of times when we farm with family members, we may take on some stuff that um, family members might be dealing with. And it, and it might not be in our best interest to do that. And even though we've been raised that we, you know, you're there for family and you're there to support people, sometimes it's in our best interest to take a step back and allow people to learn how to cope um, and get through things on their own. And, and that's actually a good thing. Uh, the last point that can help us is communicate. If you recognize that you are struggling, please, please, please say to someone, I don't think I'm doing okay. Um, and this is a phrase that is very common in our household. Uh, if someone is not doing okay, they, they say it. Number one, so other people can step up and help handle the stress load. Um, number two, because maybe that person just really needs a rest. And if they can go and have a sleep while someone else helps out and does some of the work, then that person might wake up with a bit of a new perspective and feeling like they can continue on. Also, that communicate um, goes for speaking with a professional too. So um, sometimes the nearest professional that we have is our doctor. Uh, although I really would encourage everybody to kind of identify, even if you're doing great, identify the mental health people that are in your world around you. Uh, so I know that Manitoba, um, at least they used to, I hope they still do, had an amazing uh, farm stress line, farm health line. Uh, so that hopefully is an avenue for everyone. Um, my take home message for you, sorry, my daughter's dog is barking. Um, my take home message for you is that I hope that you take an interest in yourself and you invest time in your well being. And I'm going to kind of draw a relationship or a line between taking an interest in yourself and investing in your well being the same way that you take an interest and invest in looking for the next herd sire for your herd of cattle. So when you recognize that you need a new bull, um, I don't know how many people just drive to the auction, whatever day it is, and buy the first bull that you see. I, I, I don't think that any of us would have success as a cattle producer if we did that. When we are buying the next herd sire for our herd, 
uh, typically, typically we, we look at the bull. We take time to maybe look at its pedigree. Um, maybe go look at the mom. Does she milk? Uh, what are her feet like? Uh, how has this animal been fed, right? So I'm hoping that the one thing that you take home from this message, if there's only one thing, invest time and take an interest in yourself the same way that you would in looking for a new herd sire for your herd. Um, I also encourage you to identify what you need to stay the same. So here's what I mean by that. Um, if you were sitting here this whole time and thinking this is a load of crap, like I'm, I'm great, there's nothing for me to improve in my life, then I'm very happy for you. Um, sometimes though, uh, life can sneak up and bite us in the ass, excuse my language, but it really can. So identifying what you need to stay the same or what you need to improve means take a look. I, I'm sure that all of you, when you are developing a business plan, planning um, a, like a calving season, calving rotation, bull rotation, however you want to talk about that, or even, you know, seeding your silage, you, you're doing it with a plan, right? And you're recognizing, okay, um, here's what we need on this to improve this area. And you know what, this worked great last time. So let's try doing that again. It's the same way for us. Um, number one, ask yourself, am I getting sleep? Okay. Uh, am I eating? When was the last time I actually sat down and ate a meal without like eating while I was driving somewhere? Um, how are my relationships? Number one, how is your relationship with yourself? How are you doing? It's not very often we ask ourselves that. How am I doing? Uh, and, and if we do ask ourselves, we don't hardly ever take the time to answer. So hopefully um, in this brief time, which I could talk about mental health for hours uh, because it's so incredibly important, you can kind of identify that there are ways for us to take note of how we're doing, take note for how other people are doing. Um, and if you can improve your mental health or sustain what you've got, then you actually can work on sustaining or improving the success of your farm operation. Thank you. Are there any questions? Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Cynthia, for that. And um, I think we got a few, some time for a couple questions. If anybody has one, I would ask you, you could raise your hand or if you wanna just unmute and dive in. Um, please do. So, uh, Carson, sorry, I'll just address some of the uh, comments on the side. Yeah. So one person asked about coffee works for hydration. So um, I have to be honest with you, caffeine is my blood type. <laughs> no, it doesn't work for hydrating. <laughs> caffeine in the long run, if that's the only beverage that you're drinking. Um, caffeine will deplete your energy stores um, and your bone density. So fit some water in there, please. Uh, yeah, uh, a V8 juice and snacks in the barn office and in the vest jacket, that's awesome. Um, making sure that you have snacks with you, the really great way to kind of carry you through the day on times where you don't have time for a meal um, or you're in between meals. So yeah, those are great ideas. I noticed yeah. Melissa, you have your hand up. Yeah, can we, great presentation, Cynthia. I really enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you, Melissa. Um, we like tonight you talked a lot about working on the farm and and of course we're all farmers here and we all do that can we take a second to recognize some of the um plight of the farm mom as well who works on the farm but also has that mental and emotional labor of like scheduling appointments knowing when friends birthdays are knowing how to buy when to buy gifts and dentist appointments and doctor's appointments and age appropriate and size appropriate the seasonal appropriate clothing in the drawer right. and all the things that we do <laughs> yeah and and melissa you've made a really good point um when when i'm talking about the farmer and i have to be honest and i should have said this right at the beginning uh, i'm classifying anyone who lives on the farm as a farmer and and the reason that i say that is because everyone carries the stress load because um, I don't know if anybody has watched manure uh, after a rain, <laughs> but manure <laughs> moves downhill. So when we, when the the person who is the primary for decision making, workload, all of that, when that individual is experiencing poor mental health and stress, that all trickles down to the other people around them. So thank you, Melissa. That's a very good point. 
and and the the farm life has an impact on everyone it has like anyone anyone involved so even your kids um and right now especially like I, i'm not sure what's happening in manitoba but here the kids are in school one week they're out the next they're in the next uh, and we don't really know whatever is going on and that takes a toll on our kids too and on the parents as well so i, I think that it's important for everyone to acknowledge what we're dealing with number one um and to kind of be gentle with ourselves yeah thanks melissa Any other questions? Um, we'll have some time at, at the end, as long as Cynthia can keep with us here and um, for kind of general questions to everyone that, that had presented. So I'm not seeing any hand raise or anyone going on mute. Um, so thank you very much uh, for that presentation, Cynthia. Cynthia, I really appreciate it. And hopefully you can stay on for the uh, question time at the end. For sure, Carson, thank you. Excellent. Um, so I noticed at the start, I, I kind of rushed through my intro. It's funny, we talk about anxiety and everything. And um, I had a bunch of points written down of what I wanted to do in my intro. And then I could hear my son screaming upstairs and I didn't want that to be here, heard on the, on the line. So I quickly sped through the start and didn't even get the time to intro, introduce myself. So I, I know many of you would have seen me. Uh, on our virtual district meetings or at our in-person AGM, if we can even remember what in-person meetings are like. But uh, uh, I am, my name is Carson Callum and I'm general manager with Manitoba Beef Producers and I'm really happy to uh, be here with everyone today and moderating the session. So uh, those that have attended the virtual district meetings in our AGM probably don't, aren't here to see me speak and would be sick of seeing me talk. So I'm gonna get right into our next speaker, which is Jill Harvey. So Jill ranches with her husband and their daughters, Tinley and uh, Lila Harvey near Olds, Alberta, under the name Harvey Ranching. The ranch runs 250 purebred polled Herefords and Charlay. Jill has worked in the Canadian beef industry in animal health policy development and public relations. And recently her passion for agriculture can be seen through her new podcast called Food Careers that highlights individuals who have fascinating professions tied to food. Jill received a Bachelor of Applied Science in Agribusiness at Olds College and a Diploma in Agriculture and Animal Science from the University of Guelph. Jill's most notable career achievements thus far would be as staff charged with the creation of the Young Cattlemen's Leaders Program, the Young Cattlemen's Council, and the Canadian Beef Industry Conference, and the formation of the fully funded Public and Stakeholder Engagement Program. So welcome, Jill, and uh, I'll let you take it away, and you can just tell me when you'd like me to share your slides. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. And you can go ahead and put the first slide up. Um, and if by chance um, the connection is, is choppy, just let me know and I'll take my video off and we'll just have the, uh, the slide show up. Um, well, yes, I'm from Old Alberta and uh, I can echo the, the, the dry conditions situation that we're in here on our ranch. Um, and uh, you know, I think that one of the things that I've been thinking about lately is is how can um, uh, how can I improve the mental health of, of the people around me and what I do here um, just with myself here at the ranch. So Cynthia, thank you so much. I think that was very helpful. All of those tips. Um, and uh, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking to you about public trust. Uh, a little bit about the Food Careers podcast that um, that I started about a year ago, and then just about um, our business, Harvey Ranching. Thought it would be good to just kind of talk about some of the disruptors that we've had in the last year and how we plan to deal with them or how we have been dealing with them, and then just kind of circle back as to some things that I use myself as an advocate for the beef industry uh, day to day and how I balance that with. Um, with the important work that I have with 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 our business. So um, as Akala mentioned, we have a 250 head uh, Charolais and Hereford operation. Actually, I have about now 70 to 80 head uh, that are commercial cattle, mostly sourced out of Manitoba from last year. And what we did is we had a, a dispersal. We're doing succession here on our ranch. And so 
the Harvey Ranching Hereford cattle herd was dispersed. I still have a small herd of my own with my husband, um, but the main cow herd was dispersed. And so what we did is we purchased cattle from Manitoba and some other cattle from Alberta, and we'll be putting uh, embryos in those cows here. We're already in the process of doing that right now to rebuild our cow herd and get, uh, get our cattle numbers back up. And um, with all of that, I also um, last year started the Food Careers podcast and also the co-chair to um, a public trust advisory committee to our Minister of Agriculture here in Alberta. And I'm also a Canada Beef uh, ambassador for, uh, for Canada Beef. So I've been asked to give this overview and it's a presentation I've never given before. So bear with me. This is from a producer's perspective, me as a producer. So if there's some things that, that you like, take it. If you don't like it, you know, just leave it. That's all good. And so um, I think what's really important to me is I always feel like there is a part of me that needs to continuously improve the perceptions of the public about the beef industry or about agriculture in general. And so um, my previous career was was everything public trust and that was up until 2019 and then into 2020 everything's changed right we see so much um, is consumed in other areas so it's taken a little bit of the stress off the beef industry to be honest to a certain extent because a year prior to that we were getting hit left right and center beyond meat the food guide uh every everything was hitting us climate change etc so now it's a bit of a, it has been a little bit of a breather and I'm going to explain some of the tactics that I think the beef industry has done and positioned themselves very well. And me, myself as a producer has done to also aid in that um, effort. So what, what we know is um, that as a beef industry, doing the right thing when no one is watching is what we do best. We do. We all know that, that there's so much that we do on our ranches day to day, no one will ever know about where we're doing it for the land, the cattle and the people, right, and our communities. I think that that can be shown um, through the, uh, we can th go through the next slide, uh, through our involvement in hosting uh, people coming to our ranches. I've had the Texas Farm Bureau, for example, with the gentleman with the cowboy, cowboy hat, come on through, come see our ranch, come see what we do here. And the same goes with having media. I've had Chatelaine, um, Earl's chefs through to the ranch. These are all things that, yeah, you don't get paid for doing it, but it's so important to collect credit for the beef industry and the good work that we do. Next slide. And that go that bodes well for some of the important initiatives that are happening in the industry, which is the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Our ranch is sort of is verified, and we're also obviously a part of the Verified Beef Production Plus program. And what I find uh, about it is it's an, an ability to measure all the things that we on we do on our ranch. So if there's ever the occasion where the industry is being challenged, we can say, yes, we've been doing all these things. We've checked the boxes. This is what we're doing. And it, it allows us to, to profile the things that we're doing when no one else is watching. We know that there's a growing gap between urban and rural. There's no doubt in that. But the public research, or sorry, the research is showing us that the public do trust farmers and ranchers when it comes to their information sources. And so we do have an important role to play. And so I think that's where I'm going to give a few tips of things that I do. And, and I'd love for you to, to visit with me about that if you think that those are on the right track. So I would say right now, the environment that's out there just in general on social media, when, when you're out and about, uh, is that the public trust is at an all time low for everything, right? Everybody's like, not sure what to think, or they're on one side of the equation, they're on the other, they're anti this, anti that, there's so much going on. What's really important, I think, and I is to be very cautious right now. And so we do not want to be in the limelight because that will create more differences and, and, and polarize people. So I think that the beef industry needs to be strong 
in its in in the fact that we're doing so many great things but we do not necessarily need to be screaming from the rooftops hey look at us we're doing this this and this what i think is really a good approach is what i call the pioneer woman approach so i'm not sure if any of you know reed drummond she is uh the host of pioneer woman it is on the food network where uh, she's a city girl. She married a cowboy from Oklahoma. They have this huge ranch and they started a few years ago. Um, she started this TV show from their cabin. It's really nice uh, where she cooks up all these delicious meals, wholesome, hearty meals. And then it's usually for a purpose for maybe a processing day or a day where they're uh, burning some fields or if they're fixing fans or there's, there's different things. And then what she does is it's all about the food, which everyone can relate to. Anybody can relate to the food, but then somehow she talks about the broader story and, and it becomes advocacy without shoving it down anybody's throat. So it's, it's quite, it's quite something. I think that that approach is so powerful. I was flipping through one of her magazines a couple days ago because I have, you know, her, her teacups and I, I have some of the clothing line that she has. And it was funny because, you know, she could have this magazine plumb full of advertisements from, you know, Nike to, to Coco Chanel, whoever it is. But one of the one pagers, there was a cowboy and he's stretching fence. And, and he's stretching the fence. It's, it's like so simple. It's something we all do on our farms all the time, all summer long. And all it says is, you know, this is cowboy, whatever, one of the ranch hands. And we have to keep our fences up. And there's this much fencing that needs to be done on this many acres. And this is why it's important. And, and it's not done in a way of like, man, we're beef producers. We're the best. This is why we do it. It was just such a, uh, it's just a matter of fact thing that they do on their on their operation. What an intelligent way to connect with consumers, especially when we're in this kind of dynamic where, where people don't want to be told, they want to discover. So that would be my suggestions. If you're not comfortable with social media, like putting your own content up, taking a picture, taking a selfie, doing whatever else, I would just suggest retweeting what Manitoba Beef Producers is putting out there or the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, uh, Ducks Unlimited, some of the valued partners that, that the industry has and just looking at the source and making sure it's right. One of... Um, the other suggestions I have is that, you know, you, you look at the, some of the hashtags of what's more popular, you know, eat local. Right now, we must do everything we can to support our local communities. We know that. So when you do go and, and get takeout or if you go dine outside at, depending on what the mandates are and regulations are at a local restaurant and you know, take a picture of the beautiful food and say, man, we really loved it. Eat local, supporting our local, our local restaurants. The reality is, is that there's some predictions that up to 30% of restaurants, dine-in restaurants will be gone in the next six months. Maybe it'll take longer. I'm not sure, but I can assure you there will be a big impact on the beef industry where those are our middle meats, where those restaurants are fine dining and so on, or steakhouses. And that could have a huge impact on us long-term. I had an interview with Marcel Dle, who is the president of Chop Steakhouse. So if you want to go to Food Careers on Spotify or Apple and check out the episode with Marcel, we talk about all of this and the importance of beef producers and anybody in agriculture supporting their restaurants at this dire time for them. And um, I would say that if we were considered the beef industry was considered non-essential, we would hope that they would do the same for us. So I think it's a really good tactic to put out there your support for, um, for restaurants and food service right now, our customers effectively. I think that putting pictures of the outdoors, the environment, the things that you're doing or you're up to, they might be so simple, but people then associate that with like healthy living and healthy lifestyle. Put that in a hashtag. Now we're going to go to the next slide. And this is a, this is, this is the crux of, of, of how we communicate. Now we know that the beef industry does not have huge marketing budgets, but we have aligned, the beef industry has aligned with various 
uh, trusted partners who can deliver messaging, whether it be McDonald's um, or Harvey's, for example, and just having those producers be affiliated and having a story behind the product, the 100% Canadian beef certified, uh, certified sustainable, whatever it might be, those are all key, um, key things. What the big thing is, is once again, it comes back to that food element. That's why I decided with my podcast to talk about food and whether it be a potato grower in PEI or a wine connoisseur in Ontario, a chef in a, a, in a high profile restaurant here in Alberta, or uh, whether it be from Manitoba, uh, the Forage Research Center in, and, um, in Brandon, those those people all have linkages from gate to plate and have fascinating stories. So hopefully if we can, if I can talk to them in plain enough language and someone stumbles upon the podcast, they could be interested about what we do, but it also grow, grows public trust. I know it's just a small thing. My podcast isn't huge. I don't promote it heavily, but I think it's just my way of being able to uh, to have those linkages with people in a different kind of way. We can go to the next slide. Not sure what happened to that slide. Um, so we have uh, Guardians of the Grasslands. This is a great way to get involved. So on May 4th, um, the public launch of this 11 minute documentary will take place. We can go to the next slide. And what's exciting um, is that if you haven't already heard about the, the doc documentary, it's it's won quite a few of awards. So now at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time on May 4th, um, after the viewing, the official launch, it'll be out there. You can you can send it to your schoolmates, you can send it to high school, high schools, you can send it to friends, whatever it is. But after the official launch of it, there is going to be a discussion between Ducks Unlimited Canada, uh, a local rancher that was profiled in the documentary, NCC, and then Steve Lee, who's with the 3% Project and also tied to the UN, who is all about carbon capture and has come full circle. Thank you to our friends at Manitoba Beef Producers who were able to connect with him as, as well as other industry players and say the beef industry is not bad. It is good. We're doing great things and cattle are a part of the solution, not the problem. So if you want um, to find more information on this, you can go to guardiansofthegrasslands.ca or it's probably easiest for this event to register. If you go to Facebook, um, the Facebook Guardians of the Grasslands page, uh, the event itself, and then go ahead and, and click. And if you have any issues, I'm sure um, you can you can reach out to uh, the association. They'll get you to the right place. But share, share, share. This is such a great news story. And honestly, it is the pioneer woman approach. It does not throw anything down anybody's throat. It's just simply telling the story. And it's done so in such a way that it's, it's natural and people there's so many other collaborative parts to it. It's just, it's just quite wonderful. So uh, hats off to all those that were involved in that. So I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change gears. We'll go to the next slide. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, my ranch and our business. I'm a partner in it. Like I've been back now full time uh, on the ranch for uh, well over a year. And I've had a lot of discoveries. It's been such a change, a, a, a challenging year in so many ways. It's been, you know, the beef industry's had uh, some, some positives. There's no doubt, but there's also been some significant disruptors. So I wanna talk a little bit about those. Our ranch uh, has an annual bull sale every spring. Uh, we've been able to navigate that and still have some success. Our embryo sales, we our, our embryo sales are a third of our business. And uh, we would be one of the larger Hereford exporters for embryos in North America um, to the world. And so much of our client base is in the EU, New Zealand, Australia, South America, US and Canada. And we've worked many years over the years for to build this particular business. 
And what our strategy has been is not only to be at events like Canadian Western Agribition um, or uh, the Northlands event, the Farm Fair event, where international guests come in and fly in and meet them and have them come to our ranch potentially after, but also we go to the, to the marketplace and we evaluate what they're doing, what they need, what they want their cattle to look like and how we can service them best. With not being able to travel or have them travel to us, that's been a challenge. So that has been one area that we've been looking at. Having the border be closed to humans, cattle have been flowing back and forth. And I can't, you know, with ease, it's still a challenge. CFIA paperwork still takes way too much time to get permits done. That that's an issue for another day. But but to not have humans come back and forth, that that's very difficult or without with it being a challenge. So I'm really hoping we can move to getting that change in the near future because as history serves us, when we had the BSE years and we really cut off that market to the US, even though it was cutting off the cattle, it, it took so many years to rebuild it with those relationships with the Americans. So here it's the, it's the humans that can't go across, but it's still confusing, it's still awkward. I would say that for us, it was an immense stress having our dispersal of after 45 years in business and not be able to have people come and look at the cattle themselves and attend the sale. So we were able to navigate it with online platforms and just promotions and all of that. But still, I would just say it's still such a limiting agent uh, for us and something that we've got our eye on events, as I mentioned, customer impacts, I'll talk about, I've talked about that earlier, you know, the, the, the effectively the, the meat side of the business, and then supply costs, everything's skyrocketing and rocketing. So with the polar vortex that we had in February, we thought, well, you know what, we do need more facilities, we do need to build a building, probably not a good year to build a building. So that's out the window. Now, um, there's been somewhat, we'll go to the next slide there. I feel like there was a bit of a haze or a fog the last year with, you know, focusing in on your business when everything changes. So we were so used to being able to pick up and go down to Fort Worth where we were on world champion female a few years ago with RSK farms from Manitoba, uh, picture down on the left side, uh, or the Royal agricultural winter fair and judging those shows or being part of some of the larger 4-H shows um, in, in Saskatchewan or judging Manitoba um, exhibition. Now, next slide. Uh, but, but what we've had to do is really take uh, a portion of our time and, and make sure we still keep those linkages with our clients. So what I've done um, just myself is an 80-20 rule. Man, it, it applies to so many things in life. And so I would say that 20% of my time, I guess I'm like a true lobbyist at heart or something like that, really is dedicated to trying to remove some of those disruptions, whether it be reopening the Canada-US border, writing letters, lobbying, coming up with some tangible solutions, um, and then using the other 80% of my time to completely disconnect from that and really focus on my business, um, as you see with the picture on the, on the far side with the Charlotte Bulls, making sure when it's bull sale season, that's what I'm concentrating on. But if I can carve away that 20% of my time, at another time that makes more sense and be able to try and get the industry back on track or do some advocacy, that's important to me. Picture in the middle, that was from the polar vortex. Uh, uh, it, was, it was a picture that, it was very simple. It was a tough time. I was, I tweeted out to all my ag friends, but hopefully other people would see too that, um, that, that no matter what, we're in the elements and having to do what we do. No complaints, it's just, it was really cold. <laughs> Next slide. So one thing I've been lobbying for the last uh, few weeks here, and luckily my committee, um, the Agriculture Industry Advisory Committee to the Minister, uh, Minister Dreeshen have been very supportive, um, is to make sure that we have a plan to have rodeos, 4-H, equine, farmers market, cattle shows, have them take place in some way, shape or form that is a part, that is not just virtual. We have got to get some kind of solutions. And, and so maybe that's whatever, reduced capacity or different staging of, of events, whatever it might be, but to have them happen, happen because 
They are truly part of our culture. They are the fabric of our rural, um, of rural, uh, rural Canada. And so they are critical to have them happen. So I know I can't speak for Manitoba, but in Alberta, we've been trying to work with AHS to say, okay, instead of looking, getting 1200 phone calls for exemptions to have people put on an event and every one of them gets cleared and maybe just in time to have the event, most of them will be canceled because they can't plan. So what we're saying is how about you have a blanket because you're agriculture and you're doing these important things. These are important to your businesses, but also to their heritage and your culture and so on. If you want more of an exemption because you want to have a bigger event, then you can ask for an exemption. So those are the things that we're, I'm trying to push forward um, and I feel are really important. Whether people agree with me or not, um, I, I think that that's, to me, it's, it's, it's essential. So we'll move to the next slide. The next slide is um, back to that 80-20 rule. So I'm going to talk, talk about that other 80% of the time. So we'll move over to that. Next slide. All right. So, what have we? What have I done in terms of the 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 markets that I haven't been able to reach? So, these are some pictures from judging in in France, the UK, Sweden, um, and we've been to a few other places, and we've we've gone and visited with people, and and that's the best way to do business, right? Is is face to face, or at at bigger cattle shows and people come and see you and then they want to do business with you. So one of the things that I thought was really important is by the end of the summer, I, I want to reach out to everybody who has done business with us in the last um, two or three cattle sales. I haven't quite got that nailed down, but I, that is something I want to do, whether it's, it's a Facebook messenger, it's a zoom call, it's a, it's a, it's a one line, whatever it is so critically important to stay connected to people and see how they're doing uh, where they are and to see what the markets are doing there as well, because we just seem so disconnected now. Next slide. Okay, so as I wrap up the part of about our business and some of these disruptions, I think that I, that 80% of my time of keeping the eye on the prize uh, of making sure that our product is always uh, continuously getting better, that we're innovating, that we're on top of things. Because there's been such of a haze and a fog, and I've kind of experienced this, or people are ch have challenges that I think really do stem back to some, you know, mental health type of challenges um, of trying to navigate this very uncertain time. It is so incredibly important to say, okay, you know what, my bull sales over, I'm going to take the next Sunday to Sunday, no Facebook. I'm just going to unplug completely. It's so empowering to do that because you know that if someone really needs to get a hold of you, they can. So one of the tactics I use is I, I have a group of friends that we, we check in with each other every morning on Snapchat. Hey, how are you doing? What are you doing? Blah, blah. And I'll say, hey, if anything happens, it's exciting on Facebook in the next seven days. Let me know. I'm taking a Facebook break. So it's kind of one of those things where it holds you accountable, um, but it does give you a breather to not see that constant negativity that's on social media. And you, I just pick, pick Facebook for an example, but I do take these breaks because I am very involved in advocacy. So I'm on there all the time, but I do need a break. That's, that's what um, helps me cope, I guess, is one of my coping mechanisms to be able to focus on my business. Uh, the other thing is, is just to make sure that the people around me and myself are a priority to make sure that we're in the best place that we possibly can be no matter what. So uh, keeping that in mind, if you follow me on bright pasture, uh, any like Twitter or Instagram, uh, please do so, uh, or visit the food careers podcast. Uh, what I've done as of late is I realize that it's, it's human nature for us to have short-term and long-term goals. Long-term goals, some people have bucket lists, and a lot of those things are out in the future. Or they're really exciting. They're tied to events, and maybe you have to travel to do them. So what I've challenged um, some of my followers to do and friends is to do a go-getter list. So this go-getter list is for this summer. And what I'd like for you to all do right now, if you can grab um, a pad of paper and a pen, 
Okay, so if you can grab one really, real quick that's near you. I want you to write down um, at the top of the one side things and then put one, two, three, and then skills as another heading, one, two, three. So what I'd like for you to join me in doing is have three things you're gonna look forward to this summer, okay? They cannot be tied to events because because it's just so disheartening when those things are canceled. So three things you look forward to this summer and three things that are going to be valued skills, sorry, three valued skills. So skills that you're going to acquire by the end of this summer. Now, the reason why I, I think that human nature, we need these things to look forward to. So if you have three things, I'm gonna give you an example of what I started with. Um, my, I have two performance horses. I wanna grow their manes by an inch and a half. I'm gonna braid their hair. I'm gonna like put conditioner in there. They're gonna look so beautiful. Visually, that's just something that brings me joy. I just enjoy it. I love my animals. That's, that's something that fulfills me, okay? Now, the, the, next, the next thing on my list will probably be uh, finding some really exciting uh, people to interview for the end of season two of Food Careers. Then uh, another one I'm considering uh, that I haven't written down yet, I haven't written down the third one yet, is I want to improve my riding skills, my horsemanship. You know, I just, that's one thing that I continuously think there's some room for improvement. I also want to beautify the landscaping and um, the look of my hip roof barn, the inside and out. I wanna do some things there. And I think that if I, I include some of my, my business goals, which is contacting every one of my customers that have purchased from us in the last two years, by the end of the summer, I think that will be something that I'll be, I'll be pretty excited about doing and accomplishing by the end. I also have been taking over the administrative side of our, of our business. So QuickBooks, Herd Tracks, uh, Access, Excel, all those things, I want to master those skills. So they'd be part of my skills list. And so you can make this whatever you want, but if you could go ahead and hashtag go getter, I would love to hear what you have put on your list for this summer because there's so much that we can work on now when things are a little bit different time so that whenever everything opens up again, we are ready to go with some new skills in our tool belt and uh, some sense of fulfillment for the things that we've done. So I hope that you've enjoyed uh, my presentation about what I do as a beef producer on the advocacy front and on the business side of things and how that all ties into being more focused and productive in uh, my personal and business uh, side of my life. Now, if there are any questions, I would totally entertain them. Excellent. Does anybody have any questions? If, if so, we can raise your hand. I find that things and skills list is quite interesting to me, Jill, and I, I did it myself here and, you know, uh, I think one of the skills and things I look forward to is I, and I'm going to need to learn how to do is I'm going to be welcoming another kid in about a week's time, probably maybe two. So I'm going to need to learn the skills to be a parent of two. Oh, wow. So I think that's going to take up a lot of my summertime that might not to get to do the things like, like golfing I might want to do, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's okay. Not really oh. farm related because... <laughs> But, uh, oh, that's great. Well, congratulations. That'll be, that'll be pretty exciting. And, and so your time will fill up like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Looks like there was a question from Andre about, is there going to be a Canadian Western aggravation? Um, all, all signs that I've seen is that um, all, they're full steam ahead and promoting it that they will. I know there'd be challenges there because of the hospital being right beside um, the, the the facilities and I think uh, like COVID testing or some vaccinations or whatever being in that facility and then I believe that there's still the the beds that are in the buildings where we have cattle. Um, I, I'm hoping that um, that well obviously 
there'll be some improvements in, in the Regina area in terms of, you know, being able to battle the cases and all that stuff, but also some, um, uh, some cooler heads will prevail when it comes to the economic um, importance of events like Canadian Western Niagara Bishon. Um, and, and not only do, not always do events have to be exactly what they used to be. And so if some concessions need to be made, we've seen it in the United States, they're continuing on with so many of their events, their cattle shows, but maybe they're just not open to the public. Right, but they keep that economic driver of being able to have the sales there and the cattle shows and whatever it might be with measures in place. That's my hope. And the AGM is tomorrow. So fingers crossed. It's not easy, but I will say this National Western Stock Show did not have their event last year. Or sorry, this this year. Okay. They canceled it. And that could be to their detriment forever. I mean, another show took their date and went ahead and had full support from their government and they moved forward and it was successful. So we thought, hey, well, they'll just have it after National Western Stock Show. No, they have taken their spot. And now a lot of the national shows have decided to stay with Oklahoma. So the historic largest show in the world for many people, um, faltered because they didn't have their show. So I would hope that uh, we can innovate, needs to go somewhere else, fine. Needs to look different, fine. But you have to have the shows or the sales. That's my viewpoint anyways. <laughs> so I, I have a question actually, before we get into Anne's market update, uh, I have a question for Jill and for Cynthia. Maybe both of you could to jump in here and and you kind of covered it jill but really there's such a i mean such a negative narrative out there as it relates to beef production and and to me i feel like it that alone is mentally dragging um just seeing it you know seeing what you do on a day-to-day -day being misinterpreted um by by many different groups so what would you both feel is is ways that you know we can as a as a beef community work to battle that mentally um, because it, it does really drag on, on folks when, when it keeps building and keeps building. What You kind of covered it a little bit, but I'd be interested to see a little more from you, Jill, and then maybe what Cynthia has to think about battling that negative narrative. Okay, well, that, that's a wonderful question. I actually, last night I shared an interview that I did with uh, Steve Lee with the UN. Um, it was during the, the Royal Agricultural Winter Fair virtual series. And it was just a, 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 a tidbit of it that was tied to the Guardians of the Grasslands showing. And it had Steve talking about the $43 billion worth of carbon that the beef industry helps store in the grasslands. And it kind of went on and on. And I got a text from a gentleman in Saskatchewan is like, well, I just don't, I'm just so frustrated. No one ever gets to hear this. And so I just want to jump in my tractor and, and go and, and do field work. And I was like, you should, you go do what you want to do. But if you, if you feel like you also, um, you feel like you're helping the cause by sharing the guardians of the grassland or sharing something about what you do and, and, and let it not be boastful, let it be genuine and let it be uh, respectful. Then go and do that because you are doing your part or talking to somebody um, next time you're in the grocery store or whatever it might be, do your small parts. Cause we all will feel empowered by doing that. Is it exhausting? Yes. What I found, we were just processing cattle today. We were, um, of course, we're, I was, I was a tattoo girl or whatever, and I was working on that. And, and uh, so that's why I'm a little flush, but uh, we had a gentleman who he's working on the farm, but he does no cattle background, nothing anyhow. So he was there and he had his camera out at one point. I just noticed like last minute and he was of castration. And so I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no you're not going to take a picture of that. And he's like, Oh, sorry. I was just going to send it to my girlfriend. I'm like, no, no, because that could end up on social media and it'd be twisted 10 million different ways. And so, and then he's like, Oh, okay. What are you talking about, Jill? So I explained to him what I was doing this evening, talking to all of you. And I was like, okay, I have now had a conversation with you about, you know, the, 
the medicines that we use, the reason we castrate, why we castrate, the timing, all those things. But if you go put that out there, no one's going to be able to explain to that to people uh, face to face uh, or in a way that's really going to be um, uh, able to understand it and, and be like, OK, there's a reason why that makes sense. So I would say that we all have a duty on our own ranches when we have processing days, branding's coming up, whatever it is to have conversations with people that come, come in or whatever, or workers, and then to also manage those, their phones. Cause it's so quickly, uh, even on my own operation it almost happened two minutes, you know, 25 minutes ago or whatever it is. So I just think we all have a role to play in here, however little, however small. And that just helps empower you to be like, yeah, I did the right thing. Lastly, I'd just like to mention one thing. Always be a good friend to your fellow cattlemen. If your friend puts something on social media, um, and maybe he, I, maybe I've even done it, I, I'm not sure, but you were having a moment, you put it up too quick, it has a spelling error, or, or, or it just probably doesn't look quite right, you tell them. You tell them, and you tell them in the nicest way possible. You could lose a friend. I have before, where someone's like, hey, why did, why did you, it's not bad, it's fine. I said, well, to someone who doesn't understand what we do or has a full picture, that kind of looks bad. And so I, I think we all need to be each other's friends and then also just support us in the good times when you did put something great up there and say, shot in the arm, we're doing something good. And you know what? Our associations are doing such great work. We never sometimes hear about it because we're so busy on our farms and ranches, but I have, I have that knowledge right from my previous career to be able to say, we're in great hands. We're going to continuously fight this fight with collective partners, which is so important. Wonderful answer. Thank you, Jill. And Cynthia? Um, I think that Jill made some good points. And at one point, Jill talked about disconnecting uh, from social media for a period of time. Uh, for anybody who is struggling, uh, and let's face it, there is so much... Um, I'll almost say propaganda. There's a lot of propaganda out there right now that discredits what we're doing. And it can weigh on us. Um, but here's the number one pointer that I would give you. Uh, don't react from a place of emotion. Um, because when we are reacting from a place of emotion, uh, typically we're not level-headed. Uh, we may choose to react in a way that um, has negative consequences long-term. Let's face it, we're all business people. Uh, and you just never know when like, the information that's being put up there, number one, who's the audience, right? Um, a lot of information that's posted is written with a slant, it's skewed, to elicit a reaction from the audience that it wants. So um, if there is anybody who is dealing with, um, let's say PETA, for example, uh, PETA's writers try to elicit a strong emotional response. And that's how they get people to do things and to move uh, in a direction that they can um, kind of manipulate uh, the outcome, right? So if you're reading something on social media and you have a really strong emotional reaction, I encourage you to step away and give yourself some time to cool down, even if you have to wait a few hours before you choose Number one, you choose to respond. Do you choose to respond to that? Is it worth your time or your mental energy? Uh, number two, how you choose to respond. So I think that for us, we are people who operate from integrity. And, and I think that that's a blanket statement that we could make. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, if we do choose to respond to some of this propaganda that's out there, uh, are, we, are we operating from integrity? Um, and it's okay if you've got a fire in your belly. I, I mean, if you were to ask my husband about me and the fire that I've got <laughs> um, going on, burning inside of me some days on certain topics, I, there's a lot of times where I have to walk away and calm down, um, or I may something say something that is more detrimental than than beneficial. I, so the the stirrers who like to get reactions, those are the people. That, that it's important to recognize the point, like what are they trying to do? What is their purpose with posting that information? The moment that you recognize that, um, you withdraw your fuel to their fire. 
So I don't know how many people, have you ever seen a fire department out there fighting fire with fire um, or pouring gasoline on a fire that's already going when they're trying to distinguish it? Uh, no. So by withdrawing, number one, you could withdraw your readership from them, withdraw your business from them, however you choose that, but you remove the energy or the momentum from whatever they're trying to do when you take back your power from that emotional response. That's the number one thing that I would like to say about that. Um, also, just quickly, uh, someone had asked uh, in the chat box before while I was speaking and I missed this, and I think it's really important to address this. Uh, someone had asked um, if I have any tips for parents, for moms, uh, or parents with young kids who are trying to raise them and farm. I'm, I think the number one tip that I would encourage people to do is, is recognize your expectations that you have on yourself. Um, how many people make to-do lists? How many people who make to-do lists have 50 things on their list to get done in one day? It's not possible. We are setting ourselves up for failure constantly. Failure is exhausting. Man, failure is exhausting. And, and it really, takes away from our energy for actually caring for our children, feeding the kids, doing the chores, that type of thing. Number one, uh, set really realistic expectations. Um, instead of having a to-do list, have a ta-da list, like ta-da. Um, those are the things that you can accomplish in a day, really reasonable. There are days where I know individuals who write their list and all it says is get out of bed and shower. There's nothing wrong with that list. It is achievable, hopefully. Um, and the person can feel that they've accomplished something if they can actually get that done. So instead of to-do lists, make a ta-da list. Uh, number two, like, so you've lowered your expectations. Hopefully they're realistic for you. You are setting your ta-da list. Check the expectations that you're trying to meet. Whose are they? Uh, quite often, we are trying to mind read and meet other people's expectations or obligations, and that's not helpful for us. Um, so if you are a mom and you are farming, you are raising young kids, uh, you know what? The expectation that you will have a clean house 100% of the time, unrealistic, uh, unhealthy, unnecessary, very unnecessary. No one died from dirt on the floor. And I know because I've raised like my, my, I have an adult now that I've raised and he never died <laughs> from the dirt on our floor. Um, so, so please be gentle with yourself. Uh, another thing is if you have another adult in the house with you, the, you you're in it together. Um, the work outside, you're doing that together. The work inside, you also do together. And that is really important to start with your kids at a young age. Um, even if they are two years old and they can walk and they can carry a toy, they can put that toy away. Um, or their socks, make a game out of things getting picked up and thrown in the washing machine, whatever it is. Uh, and that might sound, I don't know, some people might think that I'm really like a hard nose. But, but think of it as you are setting the people up in your world. You are helping them build skills. You are setting them up for success. So one day your children are going to grow up and they're probably going to move away from home. And believe me, when they're around 16, 17, 18, you kind of want them to go move away <laughs> and do their own thing for a bit and be their own person. Um, they need to know how to grocery shop. They need to know how to do their laundry. They need to know how to put fuel in a car um, at a gas station. All of those things that we don't typically Right now in this generation, my generation, um, and us needing to be able to do it all and, and to be that, you know, that person that just can accomplish so much, uh, we've kind of taken away learning opportunities from other people. So, so be gentle with yourself, set realistic, realistic expectations, have a to-die list, um, and please get some rest whenever you can. When, if your kids have a nap, then take a nap. The dishes will wait. Um, and and someone else can help with them as well. So that's that, thank you. 
Wonderful. Well, phenomenal answers um, from you both. And I will just revert back to your comments on, on kind of answering my my question. And I think taking a step back from some of those negative posts, I feel is very important. And I will plug um, the public stakeholder engagement group that that Jill helped, you know, form, because they're a great avenue. If there's some big social media posts or somebody's reached out to you with some big propaganda messaging, uh, we've we've had producers call us and we've leveraged that group of what's the best way to approach it and just working in that team atmosphere to think, how can we respond to this in the best way possible is it was a really good thing to have in the industry and I and I think that group was is phenomenal to be started and just allow allow producers themselves to take a step back and think, okay, how can we properly do this and not get into a back and forth argument. So I'll just plug that quickly. Okay, um, well, thank you to you both. Uh